class here already at uh, Graduate School of Education. Um, and it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce him to, however, everybody. And he probably didn't have a chance to uh, say too much about himself when we go into courses. You just say, I'm Dr. Oketch. Let's get started. And I'm sure that knowing Moses Oketch, I'm sure that's more or less how he proceeded. But it is my uh, real pleasure to introduce him uh, in today's talk, um, which is, I know many of you here are with the International Education Development Program, but not everybody. And that's uh, as it should be, because in fact, he is not only teaching in the IEDP program, but he's also this year's honorary uh, school-wide uh, uh, global educator who has come in on a special arrangement that combines the School of Education with the provost's office at the University of Pennsylvania, where once every year or two, we get to invite somebody mainly from uh, out, well, outside the United States and largely from developing country or low-income country to come and teach. We had um, a woman, some of you, well, most of you probably in the IEP program will not know her, but she came in from Peru a couple of years ago and taught in the Graduate School of Education. Professor Oketch is the second in that series, only the second of a series that's going to be uh, going forward. Uh, not just with IEDP, but also it's school-wide and with the, the University of Pennsylvania. We're very fortunate this year we proposed Moses Oketch not only as this GSC provost appointee, but also as an as a, uh, instructor in the IEDP program. And I'm pleased to say um, that I was influential in that decision, uh, having met Moses Oketch at various meetings before uh, he came to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, now he, he was here earlier in, in March, as some of you know, and he's staying on through the month of June, I think it is, the end of the month of June or beginning of July, which also allows him the opportunity to meet with those of you who are on campus at other moments in other places. Uh, he will also participate on Wednesday at a special meeting of the Vice Provost for Global Initiatives on Penn's relationship with Africa, which is a multi-school effort, and he will also be involved in that. Uh, so by way of, um, of introduction, uh, Moses uh, Oketch received his, I guess the undergraduate degree was at University of Nairobi, and then went on to do a master's and PhD at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana in the economics of education. <coughs> He uh, since was a uh, assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, where our dean also was teaching at the same time, and I think they crossed paths at that moment, um, and then went on to the Institute of Education at the University of London. And as some of you uh, may know, the Institute of Education at, in, at the University of London is probably, at least in my opinion, the top uh, international education and maybe one of the top education research institutes in the world, uh, located at the University of London. And uh, from what I gather from uh, Moses, it is also, uh, he plays a, <laughs> a very key role and has uh, very large numbers of uh, graduate students under his tutelage. Um, and going through uh, his CV, which is quite extensive, um, he is involved in a wide variety of issues. I guess we're going to hear today on EFA, something many of you are familiar with, uh, Education for All, and the tension between access and quality, which I have to say is, um, uh, I just came back, as some of you know, from an international education meeting in Puerto Rico, and I would say at least half the meeting was on that topic. Professor Oketch was also at that meeting and also presented at that meeting. And it's really incredible, um, in my mind, I was talking with some of the older people, a little, in sort of my category of uh, older folks there, and um, th this has really been a dramatic change, a change toward trying to understand how poorest nations are doing, but also how people who are marginalized, <coughs> who drop out of school or 
the kinds of issues that some of us deal with in IVP have become so central. And Moses Sokech has been one of the people that's been called upon to be part of that dialogue, part of those conversations. Um, and I could go on. Um, I think what I'll do is, uh, if anybody is uh, interested in seeing the very thick number of publications, if you don't mind, I could pass this around. People might be interested. Or is that a private document? Or, um, these kind of things are all, often on the, the web anyway. <coughs> so um, I think I'll do that just so people can get a sense of the wide variety of things that uh, Moses Oketch has done. I think I will stop there now that you've had a, a little bit of food. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to take over? <laughs> Let's give a little preliminary applause. And uh, maybe you want something to drink? Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. It's really a, a personal uh, as well as professional pleasure to, to have him uh, speak uh, with us and to us today. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wagner, uh, for inviting me to Penn and uh, for inviting me for this lunch and this talk. I know I've met some of you uh, in my course uh, in March. I was in Puerto Rico last week and uh, just flew in um, on Friday evening. I tried to find a place to live, but finally I found one. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> prior to that, I had been on a nine hour flight uh, from London to Miami. And I learned that actually I know zero Spanish because when I reached in Miami, my English became useless. Uh, <laughs> so I needed to know more Spanish to survive. Uh, but somehow I managed to survive. And uh, we were at uh, Puerto Rico for a very good convention. <clears throat> Well, um, for, for the time that I'll be here, I'll be here in May as well as in June. And so feel free to uh, check on me or ask any questions. Uh, I was once a student like you, uh, maybe 15, 10 years ago. Uh, people think I look young. I'm actually very old. I'm not, I'm not sure. And when I tell them I got my PhD over 10 years ago, they say, you're kidding me. And I say, no, don't, don't, don't go by the looks. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm stone age nearly. Uh, um, so um, I'm very happy to be here, and um, uh, today I'm going to uh, give a, a talk on a very key topic. When I was asked, actually, uh, uh, Dan said it has to be informal, then it moved to formal, then it moved to formal and informal. So today you would possibly see both. You will see a bit of formal presentation as well as informal uh, combined. But um, I think you've done an excellent introduction about my areas of work. I, I write a lot on a number of things. and. Uh, over the last three years, specifically, I move you here. Uh, over the last three away years, away from your lunch, sure. and I will move you closer to my lunch. Sure, that's a good <laughs> idea. Over the last three years, I've been involved in uh, uh, in strengthening research capacity in, in in Africa. Actually, so I was I was invited by an institution there which had demographers doing research on uh, demographic issues. But the, the main problem I told them when I met them at the conference is that uh, they were a bunch of demographers and sociologists, so they were looking at fertility, uh, population growth, uh, and things like that, uh, and also health issues. And they presented very nice regression tables and everything, and every time they controlled for education. So everything they presented, they said you control for education. And I said, you see, you're missing the point. Uh, because education is so important in all these things you do, you need to start actually getting involved in education. So they said, well, why don't you come over and help us get involved in education? So for about three years, 2008 and uh, 2011, I was splitting my time between London and Nairobi uh, at African Population and Health Research Center. I was on sabbatical leave and then I was on leave there uh, for a period of time. And over that time I led uh, uh, major studies in education. These were very huge studies involving millions of dollars um, uh, as part of my work. Uh, before that, I was also involved in a number of studies in the UK, one funded by uh, uh, the EFID, which is the equivalent of USID in the UK, uh, which was uh, looking at uh, what they call zones of exclusion. And this is something we all got involved as a team, and uh, it was led by one of the professors from Sussex. And uh, a lot of publications uh, have come out of that. I've also been involved in also looking at um, what we call um, um, uh, the public good uh, element of higher education, what is called rate of return. Um, education, higher education is becoming expensive, but um, what role does it play in development? 
And this has been through the work I do with Walter McMahon, who was partly my supervisor in the North, uh, on what we call uh, the role of higher education in knowledge societies. So something called endogenous growth, whereby the more knowledge, knowledgeable society becomes, the more they open uh, the production frontier. So that is generally about, about uh, the areas that I've worked on, but I've worked in many, many, many areas. And usually um, at the Institute of Education, I have many students, some from the US, uh, some from other parts of the world. At any given time, I have maybe 20 masters or 30 master students, or a large class of about 50 students. So there's always a large number of students who are interested in international development discourse. So being at Penn is, a, is delightful. Uh, it's a beautiful campus uh, in the city. And I think uh, the students that I've met uh, are, are good. And uh, last month, I had a very good engagement. And that is why I was telling uh, Professor Wagner that I was looking forward to coming back. Because if I didn't have a good experience, maybe I would be reluctant <laughs> to say I want to come uh, in a certain place. But it was quite, uh, quite delightful. So that is all about me uh, before I can start the formal bit. So that is a bit formal, a bit informal. Let me pause and see if you have any questions that you want to ask about what I've just said. One minute, before I move into the formal presentation. I have a question. Yes, please. Go ahead. Are you happy being a professor? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it's a good question. Uh, it's a time it's a time frame question. I would always wanted to be a professor from, 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 from my, 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 my early years of life, so it's not something that happened by accident. Um, and I think it's one of the very rewarding uh, careers in many ways because you get to uh, specialize in your area and you get to research it and you get to change the world sometimes, not in a very good way, but you get to provide the evidence and information and you train people that go and change the world. I've got students all over the world working with UNICEF. I got an email from one uh, in Cambodia today saying they want to recruit somebody. Do I have somebody who can be a good education program officer in Cambodia? I have one who is in Dakar now, again with UNICEF. I get so many students all over the world doing a great job uh, in terms of improving the well-being of a number of low middle income countries. And I think that is itself a very fulfilling. So uh, to me, when I see that and when I hear the things my students do, uh, I feel quite, quite happy. So I think it's only through professorship that you are able to, to experience that. So I'm, I'm generally happy to be a professor. I'm happy to be visiting here at, at, at Penn. Okay, so if there's no other question, then uh, I want to turn to uh, this presentation today on achieving education for all uh, with a focus on South Southern Africa. And uh, uh, the bit that actually interests me most is the tension between access and quality. And I think the title is straightforward. I mean, when uh, I got an email from, uh, I mean, I said, Moses, what would you like to present on? And somehow I didn't think this just came on top of my head in a second. I just said, well, I think. Much of my, my work has always been around uh, issues of access as well as issues of quality, whether in higher education or in basic education. And I, I tend to see a huge amount of tension between the two, particularly in developing countries. So that is what I will talk about today, I provide some evidence. But uh, in detail, I will also give you an uh, example of a specific country. The study I was involved in Kenya, which is a longitudinal study, so it will be much more deeper with a lot of data and some insights to draw from. So um, let me just start by jogging your mind about how this is a big issue. This is UNESCO UIS data, uh, which is a covering a period of 10 years. And uh, it is on enrollment, uh, which is called net enrollment. Net enrollment is everybody of the right age in school at the right grade. And uh, you can see how countries are doing. Overall, we would expect that primary education or basic education of 10 years uh, should be accessible to everybody. If the world can achieve that, the world will be a better place. And I think that has been one of the frameworks of the Education for Our initiative. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is you can see uh, uh, the graphs. Um, if you look at uh, the top, that is where the countries should be if you're doing very well. But there is one graph at the bottom which is interesting. And this is the one that uh, some of my students have seen before. But it's is the main bit of the discussion today. This is Sub-Saharan Africa over a period of 10 years. And this is the world average. That is where the world is. So you can see 10 years ago, 
In terms of enrollment, sub saharan Africa was very far below the world average. So this is where the world average, which means everybody taken together, and this is where it was. And that was very worrying, and that is one of the reasons why there was a focus on education for all. It's why I get this group of kids here uh, to go up there. Where is the United States? Where do you think the United States is on this one? The top. It will be at the very top. So it's the way above, above the world average, which means majority of kids uh, complete about uh, basic education. So, uh, and that is only the U not only the US, but a number of countries. So you can see North America and Western Europe uh, don't have an, an access issue. Then you've got Central and Eastern Europe also doing very well. You've got East Asia, uh, then you've got Latin America, you've got Central Asia, South and West Asia, then you've got Arab states, but then you've got South Southern Africa. But something else is interesting here over the last 10 years. Uh, what can you see that is interesting when you look at all these graphs? There are two graphs which are uniquely interesting. Two lines which are interesting. One of them is this one, of course, and the other one is which one? This one. So two, something has happened over the last 10 years over, uh, for those particular regions of the world. One of the things is that Sub-Saharan Africa has made tremendous progress in terms of uh, expanding enrollment, which means improving access. And this is as a result of uh, EFA, which is Education for All Framework. And by doing that, it has really nearly closed the gap, but not very much. There's still a huge amount of work that needs to be done for it even to reach the world average. Remember, the world average is still here, and sub saharan Africa is still here. So there's still much work to be done on access. So that is just to give you where the access problem is. So there's still a huge amount of work to be done to improve access. But at the same time, sub saharan Africa has made uh, one of the tremendous leaps uh, over the last 10 years in terms of uh, expanding access to majority of the people. So that is one uh, data which is important uh, from UNESCO Institute of Statistics. The other one is how do governments allocate resources to education? This is also very important because what is driving that access has to do with resources. We can also see that um, sub saharan Africa has devoted the largest share of its gross domestic product to education, that is the total wealth of the nation, which is devoted to education. And if you look at uh, the blue, uh, the gray, the black ones, and the <coughs> navy blue, it shows you uh, weak levels of education they're devoting the resources to. And this has implication because if you looked at this graph many years ago, you'd have seen a situation where in sub-Saharan Africa, tertiary education was getting a greater share than basic education. And that meant that only a few people who are going into tertiary education were benefiting at the expense of majority who could not actually even be able to read and write. So that was the problem. But again, the good news out of this figure and graph is that of all the regions in the world, sub-Saharan Africa is devoting the largest amount of its GDP to education. Remember, Largest amount doesn't mean it's the highest amount. I mean, the GDP of South Africa is so tiny compared to the GDP of the United States. But the proportion they are devoting to education tells you how seriously they have taken education. So 2.3%, which is this one here, uh, is being devoted to education. And that is higher than all the other regions that you can see. So that is good news, uh, which should continue, and we hope it continues, because it means that there is more money being given to education instead of defense. It also means that governments are taking education seriously. But the other graph I want to show you is this one. And this one is also from UNESCO Institute of Statistics. And it's a global uh, graph for a number of countries. And uh, they're clustered. Uh, they're clustered into sub-Saharan Africa from the far, the far, far right, I would say. Uh, then Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, East Asia and the Pacific, North America, Western Europe, and Central uh, and Eastern Europe. Something interesting you can see from this uh, graph here. Uh, you can see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, this is household contribution to education and then public expenditure. How much of the education is being offered through government subsidy, which means is publicly offered, available to everybody, and how much are parents contributing to education. When you look at primary total, 
In total, in sub-Saharan Africa, 22% of the cost to education is borne by the parents. So these very poor parents are really doing a lot to improve education. But 78% uh, is government uh, provision. Uh, when you look at uh, where they were, which is North America, presumably according to the data, only 11% is being contributed by parents, and uh, um, nearly 90% is state provision. As you keep moving into lower secondary, you can see it's even terrible, because in lower secondary, 40% 40% of the cost to lower secondary uh, is borne by the parents. So if you're a poor parent, definitely you're out of secondary school, because the government can only afford about 60%, and you can imagine uh, the competition for that 60% yeah, is quite fierce. And when you move to upper secondary, again, you can see limited provision. So what you're seeing here is that parents are contributing a lot, and you can see the same also a bit in Latin America, which means that uh, state subsidy to education is limited. And therefore, if you're a poor parent, it's going to be very difficult for you to access education. That's just another figure. Uh, to let you see how things look. The hope, the presumption is that in order to have a very meaningful universal access that this, this cluster here should somehow look like this cluster or this cluster, whereby more is paid for privately in tertiary education, but basic education is sort of provided for by the state. That is where we are hoping that <coughs> Sub-Saharan Africa will get itself in a few years down the line. Now, uh, this is probably the last graph that I'm going to show you, and maybe that could easily end my conversation today, because the picture tells the story that I wanted to say. But uh, uh, you can see there, uh, <coughs> this is based on Hanushek and Wozman, uh, but it's dated because they also took the data from uh, Twitter. But I think much has changed, but not significantly. Uh, when you look at those who have finished ninth grade, the dark one, Europe, everybody here has finished ninth grade, that is North America and Europe. So it's not a big issue. Access is not a big issue. Access to basic education is not an issue of discussion in North America and Europe. I'm sure there are pockets of issues to be addressed, but generally it's not a big issue. Because a very large number, out of 100% of a ratio of one, you can see that nearly there. It's nearly perfect. Uh, those who have dropped between uh, 25 and 9, that's the second one, you can also look at it. Also nearly perfect. Uh, those who have dropped between grades one and five, you can see. And then there are those who never enrolled. And when you look at it, you can again see where South Southern Africa is falling. That is East and South, East and South Africa. You can see nearly below 60% as per the data had actually finished grade nine or dropped down between grade five and grade nine. When you look at West and Central Africa, it was the worst. So most of them had actually dropped out just barely <coughs> below 50%. And South Asia was also doing badly. And, and then there was um, uh, Middle East and North Africa. So this also tells you how access is a big issue. So that is one side of the story, the access issue. So the question is, therefore, should we focus on access? Because if this is a problem, then we should expand access. And that is the framework of EFA, as originally constituted. But over time, as we focus on access, the issue of quality comes in. So is it access which is more important, or do we have to focus on access and quality? And can there be a tension between trying to achieve both of them, especially if you're a low resource country? And that is what I want to talk about today, based on the context of Kenya, as an example of uh, the tension between uh, access and quality. About three years ago, I was invited uh, to go and lead education research at FHFC in Nairobi, and they had been uh, conducting a large longitudinal survey uh, in two slums and two non-slum areas, and this is called Demographic Sur Surveillance Survey of over 13,000 households. Uh, very many kids were involved, almost 14,000, were being followed every year on a number of things. Now, one of the things that happened is that this survey was uh, started in 2000, and then in 2003, the Kenya government introduced a universal basic education because enrollment was much lower. Uh, it had done very well, but then because of cost barrier, it went down. So, FHFC and myself decided that actually this is a good opportunity 
to nest education onto their demographic surveillance, to nest an education survey onto their demographic surveillance. So they were asking, they were interested on fertility, they were interested in population issues, reproductive issues, but we were interested in education. So we worked together. So one survey in the household, when you go to ask questions to do with uh, reproductive health, you're also asking questions to do with education. And that we were able to uh, gather the data much more cost effectively. Now, for the education, the aim was purely uh, the three primary education policy of 2003 had one single aim. The aim was to expand access. In fact, when it was introduced, quality was not the issue. The president simply said, when I'm elected, I'm going to introduce universal primary education with the aim of expanding access. Something interesting about Kenya is that the education cycle is almost similar to the US. They've got eight years of primary school, which is unusual for many countries. Many countries said to have six years of primary education. Then they've got four years of secondary. They don't call it low and upper secondary, but it's just called secondary. But of course, it has low and upper secondary. And then they've got four years uh, of uh, university education. This was changed uh, in the 1980s, but before they followed the typical British model. Now, what is most interesting is that contrary to what was expected, that when you introduced this universal primary education policy, that a lot of kids who were out of school, as well as poorer families, particularly those living in the slums, would all be accommodated in government schools, and that will actually uh, increase enrollment. That is what you'd expect. Isn't it? Because it's a universal supply side policy. It's not targeted. It's not saying, okay, I'm targeting this population group. It simply says, education is now free, but it's free only in public schools. So if you're going to a private school, it's not free. So it's free universal education, but publicly provided, which means if you are in a private school, you cannot actually benefit from the free education. The free education is implemented through a capitation grant, which is about uh, uh, roughly $20 or less. Uh, uh, given to every child enrolled in a public school. So the government gives the money there, and they also pay for teachers, and they also provide money for buildings and textbooks. So that's a good thing. And the expectation was that all the parents who are abandoned by the cost of education, which therefore meant that either the children are out of school, so none enrolled at all, or they have enrolled and dropped out because of cost barriers, would now find it easy to go to school. And two, it would also be shameful for a child not to go to school when education is now publicly announced to be free. So most parents just feel the guilt that I should let my child go to the market instead of going to the school to go and sell bananas because education is now free. So the euphoria for universal education was great and the impact was felt. And I just want to show you uh, how it looked like uh, based on this study in Nairobi. This study was designed uh, in two slums. Uh, but then the education program decided to add two non-slum areas. Uh, these are uh, areas which were, you might call in terms of economic uh, uh, well-being as lower middle income in terms of the economic position. <coughs> so uh, the upper bit is the slum and the lower bit are the non-slum. The non-slum was part of my own addition to assess how the slums and the non-slums were responding to this policy. How are the parents responding? And this is data which was being collected every year from 2005, retrospectively to 2003, and asking them questions, where did your child go to school? Uh, where was your child in school before the policy? Uh, have you transferred school? What do you think about the policy? What is the age of your child? And so it collected that kind of information regularly every year, uh, and I think it's still ongoing because uh, I left them a big grant to continue with the work. But the top graph is the slums. These are two slums, and I hope some of you know what a slum is. They are really complex, urban living environments. Very poor, I would say that. But parents value education quite a lot in so many ways. And uh, so uh, you, you, you can't imagine the level of poverty. And yet, the, the hope they have for education is, is great. If you talk to most of them, they believe education will be the only solution out of uh, their condition. Now, this one is the lower middle income. Most of these are professionals in some ways teachers and people who have gone to school and uh, uh, they are non slum so it's reasonable, but they're not really uh, upper middle or high income area. So the idea was not really to compare them, but the idea was to find out uh, how do these two different population groups respond to a government policy that says education is free, public free, and you go to a public school for free. Now, before the policy was introduced, a lot of Parents in the slums were actually already sending their children to schools in those slums. And those schools 
were categorized as informal private schools. So they're not registered by the government. They could be registered as a child center or something. But they offered curriculum, and there was learning taking place. And somebody like James Tooley, who writes on this, called them private schools for the poor. And what we found is that before the policy was introduced, like in 2000, about over half of the population in the two slums we were studying were actually going in this private school. So the government was not doing much. When the policy was introduced in 2003, you can see what happened. <clears throat> so this is a uh, proportion in private school, and the darker one is the proportion in public school where it is free. So before the policy was introduced, nearly balanced, but by 2002 you can see more people are in private school than in public school. We don't know the supply issue, but they were not there. They were not in government school. So when the policy was introduced in 2003, the parents responded in their system. And you can see cost was a barrier because a huge proportion moved back into the public school. And you can see the trend continued, and so the trend continued 2004, 2005. But as you move towards 2006, 2007, you are seeing something strange happening. That 2003 number is beginning to go back to before 2003. There's a reversal, and that is something we are interested in knowing why. When you look at the non-slums, this is the utilization of private schools. Uh, the brown bars and the blue ones are the utilization of public schools. The policy didn't, didn't make a difference. Whether the policy was there or not, it didn't affect them. They were not affected because it didn't determine how their schooling. A few things happened, a little bit of change, but there's no major dramatic change as a result of the policy. In fact, if you look at 2003 and 2002, the bars are nearly the same. The, same. the, the, the policy did not affect how they schooled their children. So it was not as relevant compared to how it was relevant to the lives of the people in the slums. So, uh, as you continue, this is what is happening in the slums, whereby, as of 2010, they are no longer in public schools. 60% are now back in private schools. So there's universal free crime and education, but the poor parents have moved away and left it, and they've gone to informal private schools where they pay some fees. And these are very poor parents. For them to say, I'm going to substitute food on the table with fees in an informal school is a hard decision. And yet they're saying, no, my child is not going to be in government school, I'm going to send my child to private school. In initially they were in government school, they responded very positively. By 2010, this is the proportion in government schools. That is the proportion that has now gone to private schools in the slums. So things are completely reversed. And the government keeps claiming the policy is success, but when we presented this data, they were shocked because we said this is household data, this is real data based on household collection. This is not school returns, which are doubted. And so the figure shows that almost 60% of poor kids have gone back into private schools where they pay some fees, and the government claims this free universal education. So this brings into question the EFA framework. Is it working for this group of the population? Can there be a different framework, a model that can work for them? So that is one of the things that has been of interest to me. And when you look at the trend in the non slums, uh, you can see some change, but nothing really significant or major, drastic. Uh, the top one is the utilization of public schools. The bottom one is the utilization of private schools. Of course, in a natural context, you'd have expected the reverse. Uh, you'd have expected that uh, in FP, this is how it should be that the reverse should be the case, whereby more poorer parents are utilizing public provision because it's free of charge, and a bit wealthy parents can now utilize the private system. What we are seeing in this context is the reverse of the two, which is what we should be seeing in the first place. And you can see here the utilization of private schools as well as public schools for the non-poor is not dramatic. So the policy has not really affected the way they school their children per se, compared to the, land, uh, to the slum environment. So that is what uh, brought us to... Can you take a question? Yes, I can take a question. On the last slide? Yes. And I think, feel free if you want to, this is the informal side of the formal talk. Yeah. <laughs> but before we get further on, I think it's um, one thing that jumps out, even though the baseline is lower in the non-slum area, you, you could say that between 2000 and 2010 that there's been a tripling 
that is from 10%, a little less than 10, to 30% sending their kids to private school. Yes. All right? I should have said that. You could have said that. Yeah. And, and if you go back to the previous slide, which is your slum schools, you also <laughs> find um, a growth from around in 2004 with the lowest point, 35% to now up to 65% of doubling. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't you interpret that as saying, and maybe you will, and you could tell me to hold off to later if you want, uh, couldn't you interpret that as saying that schooling has become so important that parents of both slum and non-slum schools are worried about public schooling mm -hmm. and it's relative to private schooling, they're willing to pay more to get more. Absolutely right. I mean, that is the conclusion I was going to get to because okay. it brings in the issue of the tension between uh, access and quality. Okay. Here is uh, a free access, uh, but it doesn't meet the quality uh, that parents have in mind. And this is for poor parents as okay. well as non-poor parents. And you can see how they are responding to that. So I'm going to get to it, but I think it's a good, it's a good point you've okay. raised. Yeah. So uh, this is just uh, literature that you don't need to worry about. But um, this, this study was driven by data. We didn't go out to collect this information and answer these questions. We didn't start by saying, we want to see how uh, these graphs look like. But the data was already there, and so we decided to study the data. But in the, in the process, we are also interested to know or to explore enrollment patterns between these two population groups in relation to universal primary education. Uh, but also, we also wanted to find out what we might call within contextual poverty dynamics uh, in terms of household level and how that affects the decisions <coughs> they make. And we were hoping that would lead us to a discussion on the tension between access and quality, whereby the government announces free education, which is supposed to be access, but then parents look at it and say, well, I don't think this education is offering the quality I need, and therefore, even though I'm poor, I'm going to move out of this uh, state education system. And so, can you actually achieve a universal access and uh, quality at the same time. And we are trying to see how parents are interpreting what universal uh, access really means and how they're responding to it in terms of uh, the choices they're making uh, uh, in terms of where they're sending their children to school. So we had a number of questions. I mean, the last one is the most interesting. Is quality a factor in the, sh in the shift? Uh, and what are the implications for FP? So when you look at these graphs I've shown you, uh, is it quality that is driving parents uh, to make this decision? And what is the implication of that in terms of universal uh, primary education? Now, the data was rich, and it had a lot of information, so we decided to look at a number of uh, factors, binary, categorical, uh, uh, variable factor, uh, asking parents, why do you send your child to this school versus this? Uh, what are some of the reasons? Uh, and, and things like that. And in the process of asking that, we gathered huge amount of longitudinal data, and that data uh, covers almost seven years. And some of the questions we did ask them led us to, uh, this is the methodology, basically what I was talking to you about earlier, about how the data is gathered. But it led us to, uh, uh, to very interesting descriptive results, which was showing uh, uh, where different categories of parents were sending their children, or reasons uh, why they were moving children from one school to another. And we looked at wealth uh, of the household, and the slums are, homogene are not homogeneous, they are heterogeneous. So within the slums, there are households that have a television that is working, even a, even, a, even a car, within the slums. And within the slums, there are also houses with nothing, so it's not homogeneously very, very poor. I mean, they Context looks very poor, but they're not always fully homogeneously poor. There's a bit of heterogeneity, and we looked at uh, the household wealth. This household wealth, we created it through what we call a composite index. You ask them, do you own a radio, do you own a bicycle, uh, do you have a television, uh, how often do you, do you eat meat, uh, sort of expenditure and asset ownership. And uh, there is something created by Pritchett in economics. And on the basis of that, you can create a composite index, and then you can categorize people into quintiles of wealth, where you can say upper 20% to bottom 20% in terms of wealth. So we created that, and so we have got the poorest, middle poor, and least poor. We also looked at pupil gender. We also looked at the study sites. We have four study sites. 
uh, two slums and two non-slums. And uh, we looked at the kind of school they were transferring into, and there were a number of options, public to private, private to public, public to public, uh, private to public. So basically following those curves i have shown you. And we wanted to find out what is actually driving these curves. Of course, we know that access is now a big issue, the government tax credit rate, but the parents are seemingly moving in a different direction. So why is there this, this, this tension between access and and something else happening, and we are thinking it is quality which is driving this, this, this direction of movement in the graphs. And we were not surprised when we looked at our results. Uh, some of the parents felt that access was important and they wanted a free education. Uh, and about 26% of the parents that were interviewed in the study felt that uh, they wanted free education. Quality. If it was cheap, available, it was good, and that was nearly public school. But a larger number, almost 50%, were driven by a well-performing school, discipline. Those are the things that they felt were important to them. So it wasn't whether the government, if it was not available under free education, they were going to look for it elsewhere. So free education was not the most important thing for them. What was most important for them was, uh, was, was the school performing well, was their discipline in the school, and if that was a matter, they were willing to pay some money uh, for it. And we think, therefore, that actually there was quality issue which was being perceived by these parents. They didn't measure it the way we measure it in academics, but the parents had a sense of what quality is. So I highlighted those two top ones, because the rest didn't seem really as important uh, and significant compared to the two. So after that, we did what we call odds ratio. What are, how do these factors interact uh, within themselves? And this is an interesting um, economic statistical exercise, where you have a huge amount of data. And so we just read uh, about nine models, and one model was to look at uh, logistic regression, uh, looking at about 15,597 entries. So we, we've got about 15,000 entries which were being followed into about 7,000 clusters. Clusters are households. So these were clusters. So it's a huge uh, database that we were playing with. And trying to see, of all these factors, which one was the most important one in terms of determining uh, the movement between schools, because we were convinced the movement was a result of parents searching for better quality for education, after we had seen uh, the descriptive statistics. And uh, the first model just includes everything. We have uh, model 1 to model 3, and odds ratio uh, just uh, tells you the likelihood or less likelihood of an event happening, whether you're going to move to private or public, and whether that is determined by your wealth, quintile or not. We also did other things. Every year we checked whether your well uh, quintile changed or remained the same. Was the household better off this year than last year? So if we came last year and asked you whether you had the radio, but you came the following year and you told us that the radio that I had, I had to sell it in order to buy food, uh, but you didn't acquire another asset, it means that your household wealth index went down. Uh, for other people, nothing changed, so the wealth remained the same. For others, it was worse. Uh, it went negative. So these are very complex um, uh, demographic exercise, which economists tend to do a lot in terms of trying to find out uh, wealth quintile for households based on household asset as well as expenditure. So we did uh, nine models, and I don't want to take you through the statistics, but the significant ones are the ones you can see a uh, star, and I'll explain to you uh, what they mean so that I can finish this presentation. But uh, the last one is this one, which is the ninth the ninth, the ninth model, which is there, which is also looking at whether uh, you are transferring uh, from private informal versus public only. So we are running a number of logistic regressions. Mm. The first one is everything. The second one is looking at a shift to private informal school only. And the next one is a shift from uh, informal pr private versus a public. Mm. And what we found was very interesting. One is that the odds of shifting or changing school decreases with uh, increase in wealth quintile although statistically not significant, which means it's happening randomly. So which means that if you've got, if you're wealthy, you are less likely to, to move scores. Uh, wherever you are, you had made up your mind to stay because you knew what you, want, you wanted. So you are pretty much fine. The odds of changing school also uh, decreased over time. So what happened is that uh, uh, as, time, as time progressed, uh, I think I have it somewhere here, um, uh, those who are moving, schools are decreasing, the numbers are looking smaller. So you can see in 2005, the numbers are big, the numbers are large. Uh, here they're becoming smaller. People have responded to the policy. 
they know what they want, they have decided that public school is not for me, I'm going to keep my child in the private school whether I'm poor and I can try and get the money and keep them there, that is what I'm going to do. So you can see as time is going, they've already made up their mind that they're not getting what they want in the school where they are. So by the time they, they're reaching 208, 209, the, most parents have already made their mind about the policy, and whether to stay in public school or to go to private school. Uh, the other thing we are seeing is that uh, the odds of changing school increase with increased level of parental education. So that was very interesting, but uh, it means educated parents were searching a lot more to find out exactly where they would like their children to go, which is not surprising uh, here in its own self. Uh, there was also differences between the two slums. One was much poorer than the other one, and the poorer one had a much more movement of schools than the one that was less poor. So which means poorer parents had interpretation of what quality was, even in their own view. Uh, most of them were illiterate, but they had, a, they had a perception of what quality was. Um, again, the results also show that um, when you look at uh, uh, increase in wealth quintiles, uh, the odds of shifting to private informal schools among the slum peoples uh, also increase, uh, but not statistically significant. So it's, it's a random occurrence. Uh, similarly, I think the, the, the last one before the, the last one there, the, the second last is important. Odds of shifting to a private school decrease with increased level of household head education. The age of the child also mattered a lot, uh, uh, whether to move the school or not. If the child was much older, the odds uh, decreased, which means they were not going to move them to school. They stayed in the school where they were. Uh, we also looked at a number of things, the effect of household health education becoming significant only when considering changes into either private, informal, or public school. Parents who have either primary or at least secondary education were found to be more likely to transfer their children into private, informal schools when compared to those with no education. The odds were almost 60 to 50 percent, respectively. So, very interesting conclusions uh, that we drew from here. Um, we looked at a number of, a number of things, uh, but uh, interesting contribution, conclusions which you can read from here. So basically trying to look at each of those sites and the issue of wealth quintile and dynamics of the different slums in relation to the policy. Moses, well, just a quick question, yes. definition. Did you, uh, maybe I missed this, the difference between, is there a difference between private and informal and just private school? Yes, there is difference between private informal and private schools. Uh, well, this is a big study. Mm -hmm. uh, these are private schools. These ones here are very expensive. Reasonably very expensive. They are very good schools. Very nice. So these parents are not going to private informal schools. No. Those ones are private informal because they are in the slums. And some of them are not registered by government. So in the, these are private informed. These are real private schools which are professional run, which are registered by the ministry, and they are paying a lot of money. The upper bar are private informed. And I had actually thought maybe you meant that some of the private informal were supplemental schools. That's an additional kind of school, right? They were not after school schools. No. Well, no, not quite. They were, they were purely the school where the child was going to. Okay. So it was not the school you go to after you come from school. It okay. was the school where you go to. So it was only one school. So, so cheap, cheaper private schools as opposed to expensive more private, elite private elite schools. Private school. Not, the not very elite. elite. Not elite. Yeah, but, but still expensive and quote unquote elite private schools. And is there a significant difference in the quality between the elite private schools at the informal private Very school? huge. We didn't check for it, but generally you can see, I mean, when you, the informal schools are in the slums. I mean, they look worse. In terms of infrastructure, they are much worse than public schools. I mean, that is what amazes us. How does a child, parent bypass this nice government school and decide that my child is going to go into this, this structure, this shanty structure, which they call a school? No inspectors, nothing, nothing. But they pay some money, and that's where they want to educate their child. And they're saying, my child is not going to be in public school. And when we ask most of them, they say, I think there's better quality in this, in this structure. 
than in the public school where they can sit down or where there's a formal teacher. And that is a conundrum. Yeah. So they're not, they're not, uh, they're not comparable. The, the, the top ones are in the slums, really complicated context. These ones are proper schools, nearly a very good classroom, very good, well structured, better than public schools. On the top one, the sub public schools have got better infrastructure, better trained teachers, everything. But the parents feel that there's not much learning there compared to the informal private schools. Okay. I know there are a lot of questions uh, <laughs> that we, we can raise. But let me finish and then we, we can go into a discussion uh, on the points I wanted to raise uh, through this, this very big study. I think there's a paper on it which I can share with you later on. But uh, these are, the, these are the, the insights that we draw from this study in relation to why universal education has expanded access. Even poor parents have a sense of what quality education is. And they search for it uh, in the so-called informal schools, or James Judy's reference, uh, private schools for the poor. And this is a tension. So the government, on the one hand, says, I want to help the poor people by providing universal free primary education. The poor parents say, well, I'm responding positively, so 2003 they come in, but quickly they feel that, no, this is not the education I want, I'm going back, or I'm going to another private informal school. And so the government is caught in between. So there is this tension between how do we achieve a universal access that is of quality? Because even the poor parents who universal primary education is supposed to help in the first place are shunning it somehow uh, for uh, private schools where they pay money as a result of quality. It is clear that Kenya, like many countries in sub-Saharan Africa that have introduced universal access policies, now face the tension between quality and access. That is, when access is expanded, quality is affected. And we are thinking that, as done, Professor Wagner said that 30% that has moved even among the wealthy is because of, remember there were 9% a decade or a few years before the policy. By the time I was showing you, they had moved nearly threefold. So they were 30%. In the slums, they had moved to almost 60%. So it means that actually everybody is feeling that there is something here. Quality is a problem in the public system which has been expanded. And so how can Kenya government respond? The third bit, I think you, some of you who are in my class and those who read Economics of Education will have seen Hamishek and Usman vigorously uh, argue about uh, the idea of EFA being bonkers, sorry to use that word, but they feel that EFA is not going to deliver anything unless there is a focus on quality. And so Hamishek and Usman have continued to argue uh, and present empirical analysis evidence that enrollment alone without learning is not adequate for investment in human capital. And that Educational attainment is now a bad measure of total human capital because quality is so low. So the argument is that if you continue to provide education that is of this low quality, the money is not value for money. And uh, these kids are finishing eight years of school, but they are reading at grade two level. So is that really good value for money? Should the country feel proud to say we've got universal access when majority of the kids are only able to read at grade two level when they're in grade eight? That is a big, big, a big debate. So, it is not surprising, again, when you look at all this evidence, that there is clear focus and attention on early grade and literacy. Ensure that you improve literacy, and USID is doing it, DFID is doing it, international community is actually uh, uh, galvanized around it. The question remains, can quality be achieved in a system that has experienced rapid access, like these countries, Kenya for example, large young population of school age doing children, and low, immediate, fast economic growth, they don't have resources to meet all those demands. Can it be done? Can international community deliver quality when so far access has not been fully met by so many countries? I showed you the data. So when the focus now moves away from saying access, we are going back to quality. Do you think that graph that I showed you, the first graph where Sub-Saharan Africa had made progress, will that graph again step back, which means that we keep chasing access and quality all the time? Can we get them both? Uh, we we'll focus on quality wide off the gains that have been achieved through uh, EFA frame. We know for sure that there's a big issue about quality. And the example I've given you here is of poor parents shifting school because they're thinking the state-sponsored uh, universal education is not of good quality. They're going to private school where they pay some money. And the international community is following them up and saying, you're right, we need to focus on quality. Now, do you think that 20 years down the road, 10 years down the road, we are going to wipe the gains that we saw in that crowd in South Africa? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.
before I open for questions, I'm going to open for cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have thank you, the professor gets to help me too for his efforts. So I'm going to pass these around. I'll start with this direction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Some got the CD first, others well, got the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the floor is, is open. Please. Um, I was I was thinking more about what you said that you know parents have perceptions about what quality is. And so I was wondering when you were gathering some data and speaking to families, those that sort of elaborated on what that means to them. What does quality mean to them? What are they seeing in the slum informal schools that they're not seeing in the public schools? I and mean, did parents sort of go deeper in terms of that meaning? And two things that I'm thinking about a little bit are I don't know, maybe it's just like a universal human um, behavior that sometimes we we apply value to something that is that has a cost, right? So maybe there's just a perception that if I'm paying for this, it's more valuable or better. I'm not sure. And but the other thing I was thinking about is sort of social capital. Um, the parents feel more comfortable within the informal slum schools that they're more accessible, not in terms of just their child going in the classroom in terms of mm -hmm. relating to sort of the school, you know, the teachers and the school staff. But so I don't know if that's if any of those conversations came up when you were collecting data. Very good questions. Um, let me answer them. Uh, let me start with the one where you are asking, do parents really feel that when they're paying for something, it's better quality? Intuitive logic for us was that if that was the case, then the response we saw in two or three shouldn't have happened. Because this response in two or three, maybe for these guys, but even these guys were never affected. Uh, they were paying for something, but even when it was made free, they were never bought. They were, these, these rich people, they were rich, they were fine. So they just stayed. But when you look at these parents, look at the shift, which means that, of course, uh, they were paying for it. But the, we are assuming that that shift was moving into public school from private, which by intuitive logic for us was that, of course, they would value something where they pay money, but they were also enthusiastic about universal education. They took it as it is. The government didn't say that you must close all the private schools. No. They just said education, education is now free. Go to school tomorrow. There'll be books. Uh, you don't need to pay any money. There'll be no tuition. Because prior to that, there was some tuition that was charged in public schools. So we assumed that because there was private tuition, uh, they were looking at the cost differential between private and public, and they felt maybe there was no difference. But then, after they moved in from 204, 205, 200, we are seeing a shift. So I think, I think maybe we didn't look into that, but the intuitive logic for us was that uh, we can't tell that the parents really valued where they were paying money, but we feel that the parents had a perception of what quality was. And some of the things they raised was that they felt that their children, when they were in private schools before the policy, before they moved them to public school, were better. The children came from schools showing tendencies that had learned something. Whereas when they went to public schools, that tendency was not there. Part of large class sizes, they were not communicating with the teachers. In these private informal schools, although they are informal schools, in the sense that they are not registered by the government, but they somehow felt that the children were engaged with the teachers. There were smaller class sizes, these are not classes as you can call them. These are dark, dingy houses. They're not houses, they're even structures. But the parents felt comfortable there, and they were willing to pay some money. And this money is negotiable. You can go and pay one dollar today. The total cost, I think, for a term was roughly 300 shillings for a month. And that's about less than ten dollars. Yeah, about five dollars. So five dollars was and five dollars a lot of money. These are people who live on less than one dollar a day. So five dollars is what they were paying, but they could go and say, today I'll pay one dollar, give me another one month, I'll pay another one dollar. And in the process the kids were going to those schools. So we don't know, but the parents had a feeling that the universal free education was not delivered in quality. And the perception was based on just how they were interacting with their children and how they felt the interaction between them and the teachers in public schools was. Large classes they used to be. My child is in a class which is very large, and uh, the children would come back home and say, "I don't feel like I'm learning in the government school. I would rather go back to my old school." Yeah. Well, yeah, bunches of questions. Um, why don't we start here? Well, I'll choose. <laughs> okay. 
Um, you've, talk, then, then you've talked about the perception of quality in these informal <laughs> private schools. Has there been any assessment of um, the outcomes of mm -hmm. on student performance in these informal schools? Um, and also related to curriculum, what is the curriculum that the teachers use and the teaching methods? Because perhaps they're using more traditional teaching methods that are um, conducive to student learning as opposed to in government schools where they're using more rote learning? Good question. As a result of this evidence, RTI is now doing studies on this. Mm -hmm. They're doing mm -hmm. studies which is built up because when we provide, presented this evidence, the USID funded them and they wanted to work with it see but I left and uh, <laughs> went to London so that, that partnership did work. But they're looking at the quality issue in terms of are the kids in these informal schools learning better? Which means that actually, is it the case that public schools are so inefficient that you can actually, because these schools are very low cost by all means. And if they can achieve greater learning, then, then there's some, some story to be told. So I don't have an answer now, but maybe if you ask me in a year or so, I will be able to have the answer from Ben. But that is part of the study that we were engaged on. Following this, we decided to say, let's go and look at the actual learning taking place in these informal schools. Because over 50% of the parents are sending their children there. Uh, they have shunned the state system. So that is going on now. The other discussion going on with the government, which I was involved in, but I'm now back in London and I realize how difficult it is when you're away from the ground, <coughs> was to ask the government that can they extend the capitation grant to the schools? Because if you're saying education is free, then why can't you send that capitation grant to these informal schools where the kids are? So that the money follows the kid rather than the money being sent to a particular school. Uh, but then they said, well, we can't do that because these are informal, they are private entrepreneurial ventures. Some of the guys who run these schools don't want to be part of government. When you tell them that they want to get the capitation grant, they say no. Then an inspector will come here, they'll start asking this and that and that. I just want to run my school, it's working fine for me the way it is. Keep the capitation grant. So they also don't want a formal system. And the government is saying, we can't give capitation grant when there's no system of accountability. Mm -hmm. So we can't give the grant to the schools. So there is even a bigger problem because the ones who run these schools don't want the government to be involved. In fact, parents don't want government to be involved. They want these schools to stay as they are. Uh, whether they deliver good quality education, I don't know. We have to wait and see. But we did a study, uh, which is published, I can share with you. This study tracked, because we collect this data from the household level. These informal schools, in Kenya, they do an examination after eight years. It is, a, it is called transition examination. It's a summative assessment, very competitive, uh, out of a nearly almost, almost close to a million kids do it every year. And only about 30% make transition to secondary school. And that transition is purely based on how you perform in this, in this exam. So uh, these informal schools, they don't go up to the higher grades. Most of them are grade 1 to maybe grade 4, 5. And they end there because of reasons we don't know. But they don't go up to grade 8, etc. So what parents do is very interesting. They keep, they keep their children in these informal schools, but when they reach a higher grade, they enroll, they register them in an examination center or a public school. So their name is in a public school, but they don't attend regularly. So that when the exam, because the, these schools cannot sit for the exam, because the government doesn't recognize them. So when the examination time comes, this child who has been going to informal school, private informal school, goes and sits for an exam in a state school or an examination center. When we did the analysis uh, in this data, they did better than those in public schools. That's a snapshot. But we follow the key, because we've got the data from the household, so we can ask, have you ever been in, a, in an informal school? Yes. Have you been in public school throughout? Yes. When did you move from public into informal? We get the year. When did you sit for the exam? We get the year. Then we've got the exam scores from the National Examination Council. Then we match that to create a data set. When we did the analysis, those who had ever been to an informal school, ever been to an informal school, did better than those who had always been in public school. So, something is happening, some learning is taking place. The curriculum, they follow the government state curriculum. Yeah. 
Okay. Well. No, no, I can wait. <laughs> this is really similar to Amanda's. Okay. I was going to ask what your impressions of the informal schools were, but but you pretty much answered that. So. Okay. Um, my question is, what about well, did you look at total enrollment? Is it possible that in 2003, when it was, there was a public school, that kids that weren't attending at all were the ones that made the percentage go up, mm -hmm. and then maybe the ones that were paying switched over? We don't know. It's a good question. I mean, we, it's both, but I think most of this data we're seeing is switching over in some ways. Uh, maybe in rural areas, but we didn't find a lot of kids out of school. I mean, that is the main argument Tuli has always made, that actually what happened was not that a lot of kids who were out of school came into school, that actually what happened is that there were a lot of kids who were in private informal schools who were not accounted for in the state schools. So the bulk we are seeing in public school has increased enrollment. is basically simply a shift from informal private schools into the state school, and we are seeing it's going to happen as a reverse. And remember, the UI statistics which I showed you, that data, that graph that I showed you at the beginning, uh, this graph here, this is official statistics. It doesn't include these people in the informal private schools. So this is really misleading in some ways because this is only capturing what is official, what is happening in state schools. These informal schools are not registered by the government. The government doesn't know what is going on there. They don't know who is involved there. <laughs> What would, the data, what would the data look like in your guess? I, I think it would go up because these are kids who are in school, but they're now categorized as not being in school. They can't be found. But is Kenya also, um, would you say, um, since that graph shows Sub-Saharan Africa, is Kenya a good example of Sub-Saharan Africa? Kenya is a good example of high achieving, high enrollment. I'm just saying, how much do you... It, in some ways, is Kenya a little exceptional, and that maybe that bar, I'm just asking whether that bar would change a lot if informal schooling in Sub-Saharan Africa was included, or would it, I mean, clearly in no. Kenya it would change a lot, but would it, how much, in, I'm just, maybe to broaden the discussion. Not big, not big. The proportion of informal school provision could be about 20%, I think across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh -huh. Yeah, but higher. One of the highest would be Kenya. Kenya would be one of. I mean, it's higher in places where you've got large cities with large informal settlements, where you've got Nairobi has got about five million people, and about more than three quarters of that lives in the slums. So, and with growing organization, I think if you go to Nigeria, you'll find the same. If you go to Delhi, you'll find the same. So, when you have these big urban cities which have grown very quickly and planned, uh, a large proportion of the population live in the in the slums and you'll find the informal school system very much a character of the slum rather than a character of rural schooling. In rural areas, mm -hmm. the provision is monopolistic. Right. So this will be representative of countries that have had a rapid rise of urbanization. But rural provision is still primarily state provision. You don't find private informal schools in rural areas. Very urban areas, you see some of this, but it's predominantly a large urban informal settlement uh, 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 phenomenon. Okay, maybe one more question here. Oh, well. Okay, so um, you you mentioned that um, students who had attended at some point informal schooling have higher scores on the examination, which is one way of viewing the results. But I wonder how you deal with kind of the pushback that. Um, parents investing in their students' education and being willing to spend those $5 a term or whatever it is um, would correlate to a higher parental involvement in the students' education and that education takes place both in school and out of school. So if you consider that statistic and you just take it by the statistics, yes, you would assume that the, the informal schools are doing better, but it could just be more that the parents are investing in the students and helping them with their homework and doing things after school with them that in, incorporate learning. Like how do you Possibly, but I mean, we've got data to be able to control for parental level of education. So, mm -hmm. um, of course, we know they would be interested to find out, did you do your homework? Um, the kids are motivated because they wear some uniform. Um, somehow the parents motivate the kids. I think the data we've got was small enough for us to be conclusive. And mm -hmm. I think this study by... by by RTI, which I was supposed to be part of, mm -hmm. and I hope I was to be part of, uh, because it's almost 600 schools. I mean, yeah. it's built up on this completely. 
Because when we presented this, that question came up. And so they have gone into a number of, a number of, a number of informal settlements across mm -hmm. Kenya. And they're testing kids and want to find out between public and private schools, are the kids in these so-called informal private schools reading better yeah. than state schools? And I think we'll once we have that data, I think it will be, it will be a good discussion. Yeah. But I, I think there could be a possibility of that correlation, that parents mm -hmm. uh, who are paying are more likely involved with their children's <laughs> education than the, yeah. the ones who are not. But I don't know. I mean, for sure, I don't have a, a strong answer. But it's intuitively, it's a, it's a good logic. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think that, Yes, and then was there a question back there too? Yeah. Okay, we'll take yours and then yours, and then we'll ask because we'll have, we'll have you respond to both. Go ahead. So, because education expenditures are a fairly large percent of GDP, and but yet that that also makes it a target for cuts eventually. And I think your argument is that the return on investment in quality outweighs pro probably outweigh return on investment for access. So, how do you convince the policymakers where the money should go? based on studies. Good question. Yeah. I wanted to find out if you factor in distance of these private and public schools from the locations of these um, places from which they have to travel to. And second, we have our um, teacher um, standards. Um, is it the same across both public and private? Good question. Um, just to correct, I'm not actually Hanushek, so I'm not actually saying uh, that investment in quality education is the way to go. I mean, I'm more of the person like Brett, who argues that good attainment and quality should go hand in hand. But what I'm presenting here is basically the tension of like the C4. Now, you are asking a question that I think policymakers, everybody doesn't have an answer yet. How do you achieve this? It's complex because I think the first generation or two or three will have to contend with some mediocre level of education. And the government has to be willing to stay on course with the hope that that will be picked up in the next generation. However, the challenge will also be that they ensure that the mediocre level of education doesn't feed into the teaching system. So that the teachers, that is this my own opinion, that, that those who are selected to be teachers will be able to mitigate the present conditions of low quality education in the next generation. So it's a cut 22. These countries are poor. Unless the international community actually just goes in with money, and there's also a lot of wastage. In Kenya, for example, about 40% of the money in public schools is corrupt, is, is, is taken off by the officials. So 22, the budget is great, but much of that budget is they just saw it as where they can now get money. And in a big scandal. So this huge budget to education is also feeding into huge corruption. So maybe if that corruption was dealt with, we could actually see greater efficiency within the public system and therefore maybe quality can be achieved. But if that is not possible, then my own position is that I think we should not abandon, we should not abandon the access debate. In fact, at the moment, there is little discussion on access. The international community has shifted, has moved away from access. The discussion today as we speak, is on improving learning, its quality. My fear is that 10 years down the road, we'll come back and say we need to go back to access because it, it's been a pendulum uh, for a number of years. And that is why I was showing the graph from UNESCO statistics, which is showing you how this has been happening over the years. And I think the effort should be to have these two carried along, but with a caveat, with clear knowledge that we are not going to achieve 100% quality. How about this quality, 20%? Can we raise it to 40%? And we'll be happy with that. But we're going to raise it to 40%, but we ensure that access is 100%. But then we know that once access is 100%, it is going to have multiple effects. Because one of the problems in this country is a population dynamic issue. When you've got a lot of children, one household with six children, seven children, eight children, and the poor, then you've got a, you've got a rolling effect. And that uh, sort of domino effect will, will, will be dealt with when the first generation is gone. And hopefully, population debates also lead to lower small house, lower population size. So that in the next phase, you've got the right number of children with a smaller population that can offer the quality. But I think that to simply shift over the debate completely to quality, as Anushek is arguing, would be wrong. 
to ignore it is also wrong. So it's a balance. So if you ask me if I was a Minister of Finance, which I don't want to be, uh, <laughs> I, I would simply give all the money to education and don't give any money to defence, or some to defence. The US can deal with all the defence issues. <laughs> <laughs> so I was the Canadian model, be clever and say, if my neighbour is powerful, I don't need to spend my money being careful. I, I need to spend my money in education. So if some of the countries were clever, they would be clever enough to say, well, if I have a strong neighbour who is spending all their money in defence, I don't think they'll attack me. I'll spend all my money in education. But it's a, it's a difficult balance. But it's the tension that, that, that I'm talking about. How, how do poor countries achieve access and achieve quality at the same time? We have seen that population is a major issue. Economic growth has to be part of it. And Latin America is a good example uh, that has done that. And I think when you look at Latin America, they didn't actually say we are going to go for quality and ignore access. Latin America is a good example. They're moving towards greater quality, but they've also ensured greater participation over the time. Yeah. Okay, so I realize you didn't fully answer the gentleman's question, at the, the last question, but we have to wrap this up at 1.30 due to other things happening. So I'm just going to say thank you very much. You raised, I think, for us, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's good for those of us in the school who are studying in international education, it's very healthy for us to understand that there aren't simple solutions, that it isn't going to be one way or the other. And this is a very good example of us trying to come to grips with these different tensions. Tension's a good word, I think, for us. So I want to thank you again, Moses. This was very interesting. And we'll look forward to updates over time. Thank you very much.